Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today on the program, I have the pleasure of having Bong Aquino. Norberto Bong Aquino III is the evangelist of the ICOC Cavite region in the, the Philippines. He's married to Maria Teresa. They've been married for 21 years, and they have a son named Derek. They, they serve uh, the entire uh, Cavite church. They've got over 400 disciples broken down into three sectors and two different zones. They provide vision and guidance for the spiritual growth and direction of their church. Bong and Tess, as they're called, were both converted in the campus ministry. Bong was a v- basketball varsity player and was reached out to in the arts, media, and sports sector in December of 1994. He's trained up, raised up as a ministry in- intern, and then became a missionary to Batangas and led the church there from 97 until 1999. They served in the Manila Church as region leaders and were appointed as an evangelist and women's ministry leader in 2003. Currently, they serve as the geographic region leaders of the ICOC Philippines for the South Luzon Churches, that's Cavite, Laguna Batangas, Rizal, and Quezon, along with Mindoro and Bicol regions. Aside from working full-time in the ministry in his spare time, Bong studies about health and fitness and became a certified fitness trainer. He's also passionate about endurance sports, particularly triathlon. He is an Ironman finisher. Before we get into the program, I'd like to let you know about a mission planting happening in the summer of 2021. We're planting a church in Flagstaff, Arizona, and Pam and I are looking for people interested in leading that team as well as joining that team as members. If you're interested, please contact me at rob at tucsonchurchofchrist.org, rob at tucsonchurchofchrist.org, or you can call Pam or email her at pamelajskinner at gmail.com. It's a great situation. There's a small house church there right now that's been there for a while, and I'll be organizing and training the mission team members to go up there, and we'll be there for part of the summer next, next year in order to get that church off the ground. So if you're interested in that, it's exciting. Love, love for you to contact me about that. Thank you. Bong, welcome to the program today. Yeah, great to be with you, Rob. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, Bong, we, we became friends through different conferences, uh, times in the Philippines when we were living in, in Japan. Uh, can you tell me, how did you become a Christian? Um. I think God used sports uh, to reach out to me. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Bobby Deloy, who was a basketball varsity player of one of the IV League school here in the Philippines, along with another brother, Amart, uh, reached out to me uh, and invited me to church. And I knew I knew the guy because he was the current rookie of the year that uh, of that of the league, 1994. So. Uh, and that was it. I went to church, and the uh, rest is history. Okay, so you're a basketball player in college. Yes. And yes. W- what I played? Uh, what like in the U.S. I played in a, I played in a Division Two school. Like uh, there's an Ivy League, and then there's Division Two. So I I was playing in a Division Two uh, uh, college league, and then this brother Bobby is playing for an Ivy League school. So just wanted to make that connection. And then, lo and behold, he invited me to church and then uh, asked me to study the Bible. And then that's it. Okay. Okay. So yeah. what, was the, what was the name of the university you went to? Uh, Rizal Technical University. Okay. So that, that was in Rizal, was not in Manila. I, it was in Manila. It was in Manila. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, it's Manila. Okay. So that was 1994. Now, Bong, I got to ask you, how did you get the name Bong? Your, your name officially is Norberto Aquinas yes. the third, but you go by Bong. How did you get that nickname? I mean, it, it seems that most Filipinos that I've met have some type of a nickname. Yeah. Um, my grandfather is Nor- also Norberto. My dad is Norberto, so that's why I'm the third. He's the senior, and then I'm the third generation. But my grandfather's nickname is Berto. And then my father's nickname is Boy. And then uh, my ate, 
is Beng. And then I'm Bong. And then my little brother, who's now, he's no longer little now, he's old. He, his, name is, his nickname is Bob. So it's all B. <laughs> it's all B. So I think it's, it runs in the family. So, Did, so your parents just came up with that and just said, hey, this is your nickname. We're going to call you Bong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now tell me, can you just, I know this is a diversion from our conversation here. Where do all the nicknames come from in the Philippines? How come everyone's got nicknames? I think it's because, um, like usually, like Nor Norberto is a long name. <laughs> so they want to call people, okay, by a short name, which is much easier to remember. Mm -hmm. So like, say, bong. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so everybody remembers that boy or bang or test. Uh, Tess's name is Maria Teresa, mm -hmm. so it's kind of long. So right. the shorter version is Tess, so it's easier to remember and it's easier to say. So okay, I think that's the reason why. <laughs> now speaking of Tess, how did you guys meet? Um, I met Tess uh, in one of the in one of our full time ministers meeting. I was still an intern then. She was um, already leading a church in Batangas. Um, so, uh, we had a chance to meet, but I got to meet her personally when I was sent to lead the church in Batangas, 1997. Mm. So, so we co as singles, we co-led co a church together. So, you know how it is when you, lead, when you lead together, you get to share a lot of things together, you pray together, you you, read, you, you had your meetings and everything, so things just started to develop. Yep, that happens. I know Pam and I started to lead together a campus ministry in the uh, yes. Bay Area, and you know, lots of planning meetings and talks, and you know, yeah. sparks start to fly. That's yeah. why I always encourage people. Like I encourage uh, the singles. You want you want to meet your wife. You go to a mission field. <laughs> I know it really makes a difference. Well, in my interview yeah. with Sean Wooten, that's how he fell in love with his future wife, Elena, as they yeah. went on a mission team to uh, Kiev. So interesting. Now, w regarding Tess, wh what was it about her? What what stood out to you about her that made her so special? I think aside from definitely what, I'll be honest. Definitely, one of it is the looks. Uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like the way she looked. Uh, definitely, <laughs> but I, but there's a, but there's something about her, particularly uh, what she gave up and her dream and vision for God's church. Even uh, resigning from her job in a bank and then going to a mission field, that uh, that was something that got my attention. Uh, she was, she's the type of a, uh, of a woman that is willing to, uh, give up everything for God. Mm. So that was because the bank that she worked in was very near her home. So comfort wise being a disciple, it was like, it, it was a good setup for her, but she was willing to leave all of that just to be in a mission team and go on a mission field. And then I, whenever we talk. I'm just inspired by uh, her heart for God. She eventually deepened my conviction as far as taking down notes in quiet times. Because like, uh, even up until now, we, uh, we sometimes we have some, uh, no, we have some uh, uh, bumps because she still has her old quiet time notebooks. She writes down her quiet time and she has stacks and stacks of uh, note, her, her, her notebooks where she writes her quiet time and her prayers and her struggles. Like it, it, talk, it occupies a lot of space in our, in our house. But, but, like that, but that really inspired me because she definitely inspired me in my own walk with God by the way she walked with God every single day yeah. um, during that time and even up until this time. So it's a combination so, of her physical parents. She's a beautiful woman. Plus, she's a spiritual woman. Yes. So she yes. really, really had it all. Everything that you're looking for in a, in a person. Yeah, I'm I'm blessed. 
That's great. I'm blessed by God to be able to have uh, such a woman yeah. in my life. Congratulations. Now, you're leading the Cavite region of the Metro Manila Church. Is that right? Now, um, the geography... Cavite is, uh, Cavite is um, the first province south of Manila. Okay. It's no longer part of the Manila Church. It's... Um, uh, it's already a separate church, but it's one of the churches nearer Manila. So it's like an hour or two uh, to get to our province. So right. So it's it's group, still uh, it's still on Manila Bay though. It's 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 south there. Yeah. It, uh, if, yes, yes. Yes. And it's it's a big province. I was reading about it, and it's a heavy industrial area, and it's growing yes. quite a bit. Yeah, sometimes they call it a uh, part of Mega Manila uh, because it's very near Manila. And most of the workforce that we have works in Manila or some from Manila go to our province to work. So I that's see. why they call it Mega Manila. Okay. And so you're you're not part of the Manila church. You don't go to those staff meetings there. You, you have your own program, essentially. Yeah, I, I I have my own meetings in the in, in the church, but I still attend meetings in Manila since uh, I'm part of the Philippine Leadership Council. So as a full time minister, I attend the meetings and uh, join them. Okay, sounds good. Now, one of the things that's inspired me about the Philippines and talking to to you and to others like Ariel Estrada and other Philippine leaders is you're planting so many churches. I mean, there's so many churches and, and the creativity and the way that you're doing it is very inspiring to me. And I really want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And how are you doing that? Because, you know, one of, the, one of the main drivers of this program is to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. And so I want to talk about what are you guys doing to multiply churches? Can you tell me about... How, how many churches you've been sending out? And let's just start right there. What kind of progress have you seen in the expansion of the gospel in the Philippines? Right now in the Philippines, we currently have 32 churches. And um, we still use, we, we, still, we still send out mission teams to these churches. But I think there was a time when 2013 onwards that, uh, and this just happened. Um, we've had Christians go home to their provinces or Christians working in the provinces and they start having roots there. But since they're strong disciples, they have deep convictions. Um, they start small groups there. They, they, they first start Bible talks or small ministries. And then it just starts growing. They reach out to their uh, families. They reach out to their community. They reach out to their uh, co-workers. And it, it, and it just starts to grow. That's why we call it organic churches organic or organic ministries because it's not like we gather them and then we send them out. But it's just like disciples who, are, who have been strengthened in Manila or in some province and then they go they go back to their own province and then a ministry uh, just happens okay so 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 the church started in manila the philippines in 1989 preston and sandy shepherd led a planting there yeah and now yes. you have 32 churches but a lot of those have been what you call organic churches now that's different yeah. than the way things used to be because in the past um you know, a lot of times it's like you, you can't really go back to the province because you might just fall away and you're going to struggle and you won't be a part yeah. of a, a growing kingdom church. So people yeah. really were, were stuck. How did that change happen? Like when did, when, did, when did you start going, wait a second, this might be an opportunity to expand God's kingdom. How, how did that yeah. change happen? Well, I think it happened because, um, because of a need because of a need. Um, technically, uh, we're, right now we're grateful for the, uh, 
for our missions uh, society because uh, they've been supporting the work of the Philippine churches. Uh, but there was a time that we were really, we were really um, tight financially as far as sending churches. So we were even at a loss during that time. But I think that's why God opened doors of opportunities uh, that, and even it, it opened, it opened our mind that uh, things can be done in a different way. And the thing to do, the thing to, the way, the way to go by it is just by really strengthening Christians and giving them deep convictions as far as who they are as disciples, and then uh, giving um, and helping them see the most of the opportunity that they have, like. If they go home to the province, uh, I know it's going to be challenging, but our goal is to help them be connected with the nearest church that is, the, uh, that is there. And it's kind of funny, like, because uh, in the beginning, like, we have one brother. His name is um, Ferdi and uh, Weng Elnar. Um, the church that they're leading right now is um, four to six hours traveling time going to the nearest church. Uh, church to them that is ICOC Albay, but there was a time that when they went back to their uh, province, they would travel that. They would travel from their province to ICOC Albay, that's in the Beagle region, for six hours on Sundays just oh, to worship. Oh my gosh, no, that was by so, bus or something like that. By bus, by bus, yes. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, they were strengthened in their faith, and they they were given the vision that. The reason why you are in your place right now is so that God can eventually build his ministry there. And it did happen. It did happen. Ferdinand Wang prayed about it. They set up their business. And um, they, they reached out to a, another businessman who became a disciple. And then the two of them uh, also reached out to another businessman. And, uh, and, and they became six. And then they're... And then their uh, families became their, their sons and daughters became Christians, and they they reached out to their community. Right now, there's around 34 um, disciples in that in the province of um, Ferdinand Wang in ICOC uh, Camarines Norte. So it was it, it was like that. It just organically grew. Wow. So, okay, so that, that's, that start happening. So can, are there any other like bright spots, any other situations like that where you've, where you've seen really rapid growth uh, with a person going back to, um, to the province? Because I recently interviewed uh, a man named Wayne Kishbaugh who did that in Japan. And um, mm -hmm. that's pretty inspiring. And I, I know that Kelly Boyd is doing that in Oregon and his his interview just came out just recently. So there's certainly uh, I feel like there's the spirit is really guiding in a certain direction. I think what what you're doing in the Philippines is going. Can you share any other bright spots? Other people that have gone back and started something in in their local province. Yeah, like even, even in the Beagle region, the the other the other church ICOC Cam Camarines uh, Sur, the church leader was a former missionary in Sambuanga, then he went to Manila, and then he went back to his province, and then um, then he, he started his ministry there, and, and he, just started to, he just started to grow. So uh, his name is uh, Oliver and uh, Bengolapa, so they're now leading the church there. It's at a, the church of around 50-plus uh, membership. So that's another story. But right now, we have another, we have a great story of, uh, and, and this just started during the lockdown. Okay, we have this brother, Fernan. Um, he was counted out of the church, pero, but he wanted to come back. And he lives in a province that you have to travel by boat. And um, what he did, he, he would travel by boat uh, from his province in Masbate, going to Albay to attend church and uh, do his restoration studies. And then the lockdown happened. The lockdown happened and um, he wasn't able to travel. There were restrictions because of COVID-19, but he continued his, he continued his uh, restoration study online. Um, he, would, he would attend the virtual worship services and then he would study the Bible with, 
the brothers in ICOC Albay, led by Remiren Mencho Bodigon, and uh, he got restored. And the thing is, he got restored there. He started reaching out to uh, the members of his old church. And the campus ministry leader of his old church studied the Bible online, got hooked up with the, with the, with the disciples in ICOC Albay, and he became a disciple. <laughs> what, uh, his former pastor in that church by the name of Rene also studied the Bible. And he studied the Bible with the brothers. And then he was also convicted by the Spirit. And then he, when he did the, when he did the sin study, and repentance study, what he did was like, he, he stood up in his old church and apologized to his old church for the wrong teachings that he shared and that he would eventually make things right. Wow. And then, uh, so, he, so, so he repented, he got baptized, and then he, re, he started reaching out to, to the members of his other church. His wife became a disciple. His son became a disciple. And then right now, just in this lockdown alone, um, there, there's now eight Christians in the island of Masbate during yeah. this lockdown. Okay, so I'm trying to look for Masbate. Where, where is that in, in the map of the Philippines? That's in the Beagle, that's in the Beagle region. Okay. In the Beagle region. Is that, in, is that north of, of Manila? Is that south of Manila? South, south of Manila. Okay. Okay, okay. is that central, central Philippines? Uh, that's, uh, that's north. Central Philippines is north. Okay. So this brother was getting restored, and then he, part of it, he's, he reached out to his old friends and his old pastor. Yes. Yes, yes. And and that pastor became a Christian then made a yes. public statement to the church that he was leading. Yes. Yes, yes. Oh my yes. gosh. And so eight people have become Christians? Yes, yes. That's in the Beagle region, yeah. That's in amazing. That that's totally amazing. You know, as you as you think about future growth in the kingdom, what what would you say to people maybe from because people are listening from around the world? And I know sometimes people go, well, you know, those Filipinos, they're just very open and soft-hearted to God. I don't know if that could really work in my country. You know, maybe persons in Scandinavia or Norway or, you know, Western Europe or something, you know, maybe back in the States or something like that. What, yeah. what can people take away from what you're doing there that they could apply? Yeah. I think I... I believe in what Isaiah said that uh, God's word will not return empty-handed. It, it will always do its purpose. Uh, once you share it, 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 it will always do its purpose. It would, it would eventually cultivate the, the heart of a person. Especially, yes, yeah, yeah, part of it, yes, it is true. Uh, Filipinos have a soft heart for God. But I think everybody has a heart for God because we were created in His image. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of really believing that if you do something, God can be able to do something with what you do because we're, uh, we're all His vessels. Yeah. We're all His instruments. And if we allow ourselves to be an instrument of God, and that's regardless of whatever country you are in. I, I, think, of, I think of Japan. They say it's a hard, it's a hard uh, mission field and, you, and, and you've been there. In, in Japan, but people still got converted. Yeah. And I think it's because people did something. Mm -hmm. If if we just believe that God will can do something with what we do, yeah, with that faith, I think I, I honestly believe that God can use it mm -hmm. for his glory and change people's lives, change people's hearts, just like what he's doing right now. Even in this lockdown, it's like um you look you, you in this lockdown you look at this challenge, it's like it's hard. Uh, people are losing jobs. Um, uh, we can't. Um, this lockdown has taken a lot of things for us and for many. But uh, if you look at it from God's perspective, now why is why is God allowing us to go through this? What can we see that God wants us to do? Then I think it makes a lot of difference because we do something. And just like I'd like to share this brother. His name is Rodil. Uh, he's one of the brothers who eventually had, uh, he was infected by the virus, COVID-19. Uh, so because when, when the lockdown was lifted up for a moment, because people had to work, he started working. And then, uh, so he worked. 
But the thing is, he got the virus and he had to be quarantined in the hospital. And But when he was quarantined in the hospital, that was that's hard because again, you, um, for those who, who understand what it means to have COVID-19, um, the, the, the struggle that you have to go through it just to get well, he had to go through that. He had to be separated from his family and his kids and he had to stay in the hospital. He had to be quarantined. But the thing is, he found it in his heart to be able to share something that he had. He had a relationship with God. He's a disciple. And then he used that situation to reach out to another uh, person who also had the virus, who also had COVID-19. Uh, his name is Emerson. And he studied the Bible with him in the hospital. <laughs> and he studied discipleship. He, 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 did, he did Jesus study. And then he asked him if he, he, if he wants to continue the Bible study. And he said yes. And then he hooked him up with us. So we, st we started studying the Bible with Emerson through Zoom. And then he's finished the studies. He's attended all of our online virtual devotionals and Sunday services. He participates in the devotional. He shares his heart, his gratitude. And then um, today uh, in the afternoon, uh, he's going to he's going to go down the waters of baptism. Wow. So That's... so it's a matter of like, yes, it's hard. And um, uh, it, uh, our situations uh, definitely can be hard from one country to another. But I believe that if we just do something and share God's word, what Isaiah said will definitely happen. It will not return empty-handed. Mm -hmm. It will do its purpose for why it was sent by God. Mm -hmm. So, Your faith inspires me. Let's talk a little bit about COVID and the challenges. Just reading a little bit about the Philippines. Um, the Philippines has been, you know, really hit hard. In fact, it, just reading it says the worst country in terms of, of COVID-19. Yes. Um, can you, what, what are some of the challenges you're facing there with it? How's it impacting both the church, but also just you as a minister and, you know, just what's going on in your mind. And you shared some of the challenges you with, with Tess that she's faced. And can you share yeah. a little bit about what, what you're going through? Cause I think people, I certainly thought this was going to go away a lot faster and here we are still dealing with it. I, 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 I'm amazed. Um, go ahead and share. What are the, some of the challenges you're facing? Yeah, um, we've had uh, a lot of Christians lose work. Uh, some, both couples don't have work. Some, um, they're living on one income and they have to be supported. Um, some have lost um, family members or relatives. Um, a, a, lot are, a lot are not able to go out. And I really um, do the normal things that uh, we do because we have to be on lockdown. Like, um, but the thing is, even though it's like that, I think one thing that I think part of it is in is in I think it's 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 in our genes. I don't know. Okay, but Filipinos are resilient. They try to uh, make the most of the opportunity that we have. It's amazing, even our seniors ministry, th these are like our uh, more mature Christians. They age like um, 60 and up. And they're not, and they're not techie people, but it's amazing. They, they've learned to use Zoom and Messenger. And right now they're like, uh, it's, it's like they may have not they're not meeting physically because our seniors ministry, they're like one of our most devoted ministries. They, they're like the ones early at church. They serve, they give, they, but now they can't go to church. But Saturday mornings, like all of them are like up. They're having their morning devotionals. They're having their, they're having their devotionals online by Zoom. And they've learned, and they've learned to, they've learned just to embrace this a medium. And I think, What's incredible about that is that we can't do anything about the situation. It's beyond our control. But we can only do, or we can only do 
and respond to what we can control. So we could learn um, how to use computers. We can learn how to uh, use our gadgets and everything. And we just make the most of it. We can't, we can't go out. So it's like, so we can't do that. So what, what can we do to still be devoted to church, to still meet, to still reach out? And it has, I, I, I think that even though it's kind of challenging for many, even though some don't have work, they try to make do. Like, um, I have one brother, he's my administrator, his name is Mon. He works in a travel agency. And since there's no travel and there's no, uh, uh, there's no tourism, um, uh, he had to, uh, I, think he, I, I think he lost his job because it had to close down. So he had to, so what can he do? So what he did, he tried to learn, uh, he tried to look for work online. Um, at first, it was more of a contract basis because he knows how to use computers. So, but he eventually had to improvise and then still find work and get out of his comfort zone of his normal work and, and uh, learn other things, learn new things so that he could still survive along with his family. And they, and, and they have survived. And, and the thing is, even though he's challenged, he's, he's serving as my uh, non-full-time church administrator. Wow. <laughs> he's still serving the church. He's still thinking about the other churches in South Luzon because uh, he has to uh, uh, work with them as well. Because in our, in, in our geographic region, uh, we're, we're, around, we're around a thousand disciples, like a thousand and one hundred. Um, the, the only full-time couple is, I think we're only four, me and my wife. And then we have another full-time couple, full-time church leader, Rolly Pasuki, he's full-time. And then Edwin Adulsuri is also full-time. But that's only us. So everybody else is non-full-time, including my church administrator. Including my church administrator, he's non-full-time. But it's incredible that even during this time, even though he, they're challenged uh, with this COVID-19, uh, they haven't lost their heart to serve people. Even if they have their own needs, they still find it in their hearts to meet the needs of people and serve in whatever way they could. Wow. So, so it's okay. incredible. I think it is amazing. That, so you have your full time, you've got another couple that's full time and that's it for a, a group of 400 people. Uh, in, 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 in Cavite. Yes. Uh, it's only me and my wife, <laughs> the other full time, the other full time person is leads another church that oversees the Beagle region. And then I have a new full-time uh, person, Edwin, who was hired recently uh, uh, last year, and he oversees another church and another planting. So, but, but basically in Cavite, it's only us. It's only me and my wife. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with the stress of, you know, Paul talks about daily, I feel the pressure for all the churches. And mm -hmm. I think that's something as a minister, I've certainly felt just the worry, the anxiety, mm -hmm. wondering how people are doing and, and yeah. just not knowing really how people are doing or what's going on out there. And because you don't have the usual, you know, connections. Uh, how have you yeah. managed to do that with 400 people? Like, how do you, I mean, just working on your prayer life, what are you doing there? Oh, definitely. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to say I've been praying more because I have been praying. Like even today, um, I'm having my day of prayer and fasting. Um, I, I said it Friday because there's like a lot of needs. Like we've even had some of my, some of, some of my best friends in the full-time ministry are not well physically. I don't know if Ariel is sick and he's resting right now. Uh, Roland as well is sick, but he's getting better. Uh, my wife as well. Um, our elder, uh, Bobby, uh, had some physical challenges. E even our church administrator, Che Maramara, had some physical challenges. And I, and I just, that's why I think God placed it in my heart. That about today, Friday, I'm going to have my day of prayer and fasting and pray for our group. Uh, my, my, my friend, my best friend in the ministry, pray for them and set this day as a prayer and fasting day. Mm. And uh, just just pray for everyone in the church. What uh, later on, whatever uh, needs that uh, we may have, but definitely prayer has 
been more intense and has been more um, passionate because there's something about this pandemic that like they say that a pandemic brings out the worst in uh, in many but I think as disciples it brings out the best in us because we draw closer to God and when right. we're closer to God definitely God can uh, do so much more with our lives right and right. so um, prayer time has been great um, Bible reading has been uh, amazing because you have time in the morning um, before I have my before I do my training I read my Bible I'm, I'm going through the minor prophets uh, and uh, studying out the studying out the returns the three the the how when 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 the temple and the walls were established once again Ezra Nehemiah until Malachi so but it's it's just been great I think definitely my times with God has been able to uh, sustain me okay. my friendship I think it's good to serve in a church where you know that you're serving with uh, good friends um, I I, uh, I always tell my our leadership group our our, our Philippine leadership council again it's composed of uh, again, it's the elders evangelists and teachers but uh, it's not just having the role it's just ha it's having the friendship the deep friendship like uh, I can honestly call them uh, best friends like Bobby and Susan Montelegre our elders they're like they're they're not just elders they're really uh, good friends that are involved in your life Roland and Wang. Ariel and Susan, uh, it's just, it's, even if it's challenging, it's good to do ministry when you know that you're doing it with friends, not just with, not just with co-workers, but with friends. Right. Uh, even in Cavite, we're blessed to have uh, great relationships. Uh, so it's, it's hard, like, um, we're the only full-time couple in the church, but, um, this, uh, this, uh, our, our full time, our, our non full time uh, sector leaders and zone leaders, uh, they've they've had great hearts in serving, um, and I lift them up to God because um, with what they have, they just uh, use it for His glory, and mm. and we've developed that friendship with them through the years. Okay, well, it's, you mentioned it's good, it's, it's, good to, it's good to go to battle with. With people whom you know that you have relationship with, that you know that, that has the same heart as you do, and is as passionate as what you do, like like this uh, this full time couple. Uh, their name is Ed and Eileen. Um, uh, they're running their own business, and their business is going through some challenges, and they've been very honest with it, but they still embrace the ministry and help people, and. Um, and they're one of our best friends in the in the church. Um, uh, another guy, um, Wensi and Lalin Duque. I think you, I think um, uh, you, have, you maybe you've met them when you were here in the Philippines. But Wensi has his, his work has struggled, but they, they 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 still run with their ministry. They still help people, and it's just in, it, it is just amazing to. to see how these people they've been our friends through the years they've been a source of our strength and encouragement um and they have helped us um uh, uh be afloat that's great during this time okay so friendships spirituality using the time productively to develop your tech but also to develop your relationship with god that's helped you you mentioned that before your training starts you've got good time I can see on the screen here, I can see you've got a treadmill there, and I can also see hanging on the wall both an Iron Man uh, poster as well as all, looks like a lot of medals and ribbons that, that you've got yeah. there. Now, this is something yeah. that's always <laughs> caught my attention about you. Not only were you a basketball star, but you've you finished an Iron Man. Now, can yes. you tell me about that experience and tell me, was this the Iron Man in Hawaii, or was this a different Iron Man? Or um, usually, in order to get to Kona, you have to qualify, so that's kind of tough. So uh, the one in Hawaii is like the it's like the triat the Iron Man of all Iron Mans. Okay, but it's still the same distance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, in kilometers. It's a three point eight kilometer swim. 
180 kilometer bike and a 42 kilometer run or a marathon. So it's still the same distance. The the one in Kona is still the same distance that I did I, I did here in the Philippines. So, but in order to get to Kona, you have you need to there's a qualifying time in your age group. So usually, like the the ones that are really uh, strong, they're like the ones who qualify. So I didn't qualify, but I was able to finish That's the, the one that we that, that we had here in 2018 in the Philippines. You did it in 2018. Now, may I ask, how old are you, Bong? I'm 51. You're 51. You did it when you're 49 years old. Oh my gosh! And how how many hours did you finish the 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 run and the the triathlon in? Yeah, I I finished in almost 16 hours, um, because I had some cramps in my leg. So, but I finished almost 16 hours. Um, but it was tough. It was tough. Um, there was around around 2,000 participants that day. Uh, a lot. Uh, there was like around 1,600 finished, and then the rest did not finish. I I I knew of some friends who were not able to finish the race because it was hot. Uh, you know how it is in the Philippines. Oh my god! You've gosh. been here in the Philippines. Oh yeah. Hot. So that's one of the factors that. Uh, made the race very challenging. So it starts off with the the swim, and then it goes into the bike ride, and then it finishes with the run. Is that how the order? Yes. Yes. That's oh the my order. gosh. Okay. So tell me, sixteen hours. When you finished, is it at nighttime? Is it dark? When you're finishing? Dark. Dark. It's already dark. So we started off, I think, um, around past six a.m. So the swim, the swim leg, and then uh, we ended off around um, 10 a.m. at uh, 10 p.m., 10 11 p.m. between that, between that time. So, um, so it was already dark. It was, so, already, it was kind of challenging in the run because, like, uh, there's some part of the run that there's no lights. Oh my gosh! Tell me, like, what? What did you get out of it? Like, what were you thinking? What, what, any sort of spiritual lessons that you picked up from from I mean, exerting yourself like that for 16 hours straight. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. I've learned a lot through that. Um, but I really connected with Christianity because when I started to train for an hour, I, I did triathlons already in the past. I, I started triathlons 2011, but it was more of the shorter distance. But when I registered for an Ironman, I really had to count my costs because I know I knew it was going to be tough. Like you, you're going to have to do all those things in a, in a day, that distance. So I had to count the cost as far as training myself is concerned, and I had to be um, systematic on how I did it. So, but I I compare it with Christianity. You have to count your costs, and then. Um, you have to really um, see the 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 challenge that uh, goes along with it. The thing that you counted the cost with it, that you counted cost, and then um, train train hard for it. Wow! No. But it it has it has it has, it has uh, taught me a lot of uh, life lessons, not just as a leader, but as a disciple. The 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 grit to uh, to to endure. Even though you're, even though you're in pain or struggling, I, I connect that with the Christian life. Not our Christian life is not all bed of roses. Like uh, it's good in the beginning. You're fired up. Everybody's there. Everybody's like, yay! Everybody's <laughs> everybody's like uh, cheering you on and everything. But but when you're on the when you're on part of the bike where it's just by yourself or where you're running just by yourself, it's a struggle. Especially if you're in pain, there's no encouragement. So I connected with the Christian life. Like sometimes we'll have. We'll have times like that when you're going to struggle with your Christian life, but you still have to move on. You still have to uh, do what is right, even if sometimes it doesn't make sense. There was a time during the run that that thought came into my mind: Why am I doing this? Why am I? Why am I punishing myself? <laughs> exactly. So, but you have you you have to know you have to uh, be big bigger than that and. The thing that kept me going was the thought of crossing the finish line. Uh, 
uh, the, in the finish line, my, 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 my wife was there, my little kid was there. Like, I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm, I'm not thinking much of the people, but I, I thought about crossing the finish line. And then, um, and, when, when, and when it did happen, when I crossed the finish line, it was euphoric. It was like, I, I would say, the, it was the fastest 30 seconds of my life. You cross the finish line, you enjoy the moment, you raise your hand, and uh, and they say, uh, Norberto Kino the third, you are an Iron Man, you 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 soak on the moment, yeah, but but it's just 30 seconds, that's amazing. But you, you you think about it like during during the time that I was struggling, during especially during the run when I was having my cramps, I I I thought about crossing the finish line and um seeing that moment happen and i've always had that in my mind that moment of crossing the finish line and being called an iron man that's amazing and i i i connect that with the christian life of crossing our finish line in heaven and then uh the angels cheering on and then um then it's it's it, then it's going to be said to you okay well done good and faithful servant you've been entrusted with me come Come share with your master's happiness and joy, and then I look forward to that, and right. that's why, like, that's why, um, even though, so, if, if, even though, right now with this COVID nineteen thing, even though it's hard, it's like a, it's challenging. Sometimes it can cripple you, but I think of what lies ahead. I think of the finish line. I think of what God has in store in heaven, and that keeps me going. That 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 makes me wake up in the morning and still pray. That makes me. I uh, want to reach out to people and study the Bible with them. That makes me want to encourage others, even though they're cha- even though I am as well need encouraging or I'm, I'm myself are challenged. Um, it just keeps me going. Just just that thought of crossing the finish line in heaven. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of my questions. Is like, what what are you excited about? What gets you up in the morning? It sounds like, you know, looking forward to the future. Um, you know, crossing that finish line de- definitely does. I think a lot of people are facing just like motivational challenges. Like yeah. it, it just feels so different not being able to connect with people. What, yeah. you know, tell, tell me what are you doing to stay motivated to just get up in the morning and be excited about each day? Yeah. Well, because I believe that things will always be better. Um, it, this was given to me by the, a conviction given to me by my the guy who reached out to me, Bobby. He would always say, he would always tell me that tough times don't last, but tough people do. I don't know where he got that quote, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I I held on to it. I know that we will face tough situations in life, different stages, but it's not the situation; it's what you get out of that situation, how you how you develop yourself, what what you make of it. Um, the scripture that always comes to my mind is this in, in Ecclesiastes you know, when, when times are good be happy when times are bad consider God has made the one as well as the other mm-hmm. so I think about that okay so God I'm going through this what do you want me to learn from this and, and that motivates me right? because I know that every single day God is teaching me a new thing this new normal has taught me a new thing it has opened my mind and heart towards a lot of things that um in a way just like in the just like in the new testament like the persecution like god how god used persecution to spread the church right i think of it how can god uh spread the church through this covid-19 mm-hmm. so that so i'm what motivates me is to see what god will do every single morning and i have that's why i have to wake up because in a way i won't see it i won't see what god will do mm-hmm. And that's why even with this COVID-19, I see that God can become Christians with, even if we're not there physically. Right. Even if we're not there physically, we can still we can still start a ministry. We can still start a church. Even if people get sick, like people can still become Christians. So, so that's why it, it motivates me to wake up in the morning and pray and do all these things because I know that God is going to do something new. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about getting up in the morning. How do you how do you work as a minister? You've got four hundred people that you're responsible for directly, plus other regions that you're kind of overseeing and coaching. How do you do the training and raise a family? I, I'm sure that there's people who are listening that that are like, 
thinking, man, I'd like to, you know, I'm out of shape. I'm, I need to exercise more. I, I'd love to do that, but man, I'm just, I'm too busy. I've got so much going on and I don't have the time to do it. But you literally ran an Ironman and, and, and ran a ministry and your ministry has been growing. How do you do it? Like, how do you give yourself permission to, to train and put in the time necessary to stay in shape? Yeah. Um, before the lockdown, um, prior to triathlon, what I loved doing was having my prayer runs. Um, I like run like an hour, hour to two hours. I go out and that's where I do my prayer time. I, I, you, I, I think you, you like hiking. So maybe in your hiking, you, uh, you hike, but you pray. Right. So, uh, I, I do that. I, I love to have prayer runs. Uh, I, I run and then when I rest for a bit, I pray and then I run again and then I just sing songs to God as I, as I run. And uh, even as I, and I, and I transition that even when I bike, like I was telling my wife, like even, even, even during the Ironman, when I was doing my bike, uh, I, I had to bike for like uh, around six hours, five to six hours. During the bike course, when I was like passing the uh, mountain range, I was like, "God, this is." Inc- this is- I-, I was like praying during the bike, <laughs> and just in awe of God's amazing creation. Like, um, it's it's a mindset that, in a way, that you have to discipline yourself. That um, because a relationship with God is a lifestyle. It's mm-hmm. it's not like you, you can't compartmentalize it. Okay, I'm having my time with God. Okay. No, it, you, you, you walk with God the whole day, being aware of his presence. So even, even if I'm training, I'm aware of his presence, that, that, that he's with me. So, and, and that's why in the mornings I do that. I, I, do, prayer, I, I do prayer rides, I do, I do uh, prayer runs, uh, and, and, and that's where I train as well. So, so essentially but, what you're doing is you're like combining, you're combining spiritual training with, with physical training. Yes, yes. And that's a great idea. Like like going on a prayer walk. If someone were simply to yes. just go out for a prayer walk, you're you're getting both both things done. Yes. yes, I and even with the ministry now, like um we're at home, so uh we don't usually go out. So all of my all all of my online appointments uh, all of my appointments are online. So I try to manage it like in between appointments, uh like now after this. Most likely, I'm going to have my. I'm going to run one hour in the treadmill, and then have my weight training before my next appointment. So I try to squeeze in in between uh, appointments, so that uh, I could eventually uh, still uh, train. And I need it because I think, uh, especially when you're when 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 you're on the screen, uh, you you have to detox. You have to you have you have to. You have get you have to get uh, your blood moving. If not, uh, you, I'm gonna get sick. So right. I, I do now. I do it in between appointments. Okay, so, so let's 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 talk a little bit about the detox. You mentioned that Tess, you've you've asked her to kind of limit her screen time. Can you talk a little bit about that? What you've seen there and what's happening and kind of some of the the boundaries you've had to set with, uh, you know, online appointments. Yeah. Yeah, we have to do that because um, in the in the beginning we thought that okay, since we're on lockdown, uh, we're gonna do less because we're on lockdown. But lo and behold, when we were on lockdown, we we eventually did more mm-hmm. because we we eliminated the we eliminated the the travel time. So there's no travel time, so we can just jump from one appointment to another. So. You can have a you can have a two hour meeting and then afterwards you, you could you could go to a you could go to a a, a Bible study or a D time or uh, just jump from one appointment to another and and lo and behold like we had so much screen time that it's affecting us physically so we had to uh, now discipline ourselves to um, not cut appointments but just be wise in how we. Uh, on how we uh, set our appointment. So um, that's why for Tess, it's managing her screen time, but not stopping her from having her phone calls or communicating through text. So she does that. She gives direction. 
she gives advice through it so it's just being wise because right. um the, the 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 radiation of the screen eventually, eventually has an effect on us. So that's why for me, I have to run. So that's my way of detoxing. Mm -hmm. That's when, smart. When I when I when I get out of the screen and then perspire and then uh, uh, do some do do some strength training and then rest and then go to my next appointment. Now a tread so that, a treadmill is so boring. Do you do you listen to something while you're while you're on that treadmill? I mean, it just yes yes. I I have I have a I, um. This eventually is my this eventually is my pain game. So here's here's the here's my bike and then here's my treadmill oh my and then gosh. here's the computer. Wow. So so when I run, I eventually have I know I I I do a, I do a virtual I know I, I do a virtual running. Uh, there's a virtual running program that I eventually look into. And then when I bike, I usually um um uh, listen to music and or look at a triathlon video I just see. to keep my uh mind in focus inspiration so, and focus there yeah it's eventually it's, well, this is this is my uh this room is my pain cave it's my physical and spiritual pain cave it's where i train physically but it's also where i train spiritually like so this is where i so when i'm in here like uh, it's like it's it's like it's like my sanctuary. Yeah, it's my, a it's a total and spiritual and okay, yeah. It's what uh, many people call a man cave. I mean, yeah, I know that the listeners cave. can't see this, but it's there's a a treadmill. You've got all your trophies on the wall. You've got a bicycle set up there on a, a stationary platform plus bookshelves. Yeah, and it, it looks really awesome. Looks like a your your wife Tess is super loving. I can tell she must have just given you this whole room to. to Make it the way you like yeah. it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just awesome. Like, like just talking to you, I go, man, this this guy's just done amazing things. You, you're an Iron Man finisher, which is awesome. You're doing amazing things in the ministry. Can you tell me about a time when you had to fight back from failure? I mean, is there there been some times where you had to really work through something really difficult and you had to overcome it? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think. This is something for um, everyone to hear because, like, sometimes it's true. Like, sometimes people look at you and they say that uh, you've done well, and um, but there was a time in my life that I struggled. In fact, I struggled with sin, and I had to be uh, disciplined and taken out of the ministry. So, um, and it was. A challenging time. I had some personal challenges that I had to overcome. It eventually led me to sin. And um, the thing is, that's why I, I know I know you know this brother. His name is Gordon Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, one of the times that I talked to him, he, he mentioned to me he mentioned to me that, and that has that has always uh, resounded in my ear and in my mind. Don't waste your sin. And I'm, you know, you, here's Gordon. Bong, don't waste your sin. Don't you, you, waste you know, your he, sin. Yeah, he, 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 that's his accent. Like, yeah. And that has always been in my mind. Uh, uh, I fell into sin, yes. But you get back, you get back up. That's your failure. You get back up. You learn from it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm grateful that I have a wife that, that's very supportive of me, who's helped me get back up. Who listened to me but didn't tolerate me? Mm. Well, you 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 know you know our wives like right. they listen to you, but they give you a piece of their brain and their heart. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So she didn't tolerate me, and I have a good set of friends like Coco. Coco picked me up. Coco and Rile, you know him. Mm -hmm. uh, he picked me up. He believed in me. Ariel was there as well. Uh, he helped me. Uh, Lauren Scusi. Uh, all of these brothers, they they helped me get back up, and even the church in Cavite um, believed in me and helped me get back up. But the thing is, um, it was tough because I had to I had to wrestle with the thought of of giving up, and I've had my back door. Uh, my family is all in the states; they're all in California. My mom is in California. My brother. Is there as well, and then my sister is in Virginia. 
So that was my that that was probably my cause prior to becoming a disciple. And then uh, being a disciple, uh, I've had my petition already to go to the states, but I didn't go because I went on a mission field. Wow. So, so but I choose to stay. And then all of a sudden, I had to be taken out of the ministry. And I take responsibility for my sin. I I sinned, and I eventually deserved it. I had to be disciplined, and I had no questions about that. But you know how it is in your mind. You think you've given up everything, and then this is what happens to you. Mm-hmm. And the door was open. The right. door was open, and, and and I had to struggle with it. Is this what God wants me to do to go to the states, or does He want me to learn from my mistake mm-hmm. and be a better person and still continue with the path that He has laid down before me? Right. And I had to wrestle with that, especially when you don't have uh, food to put on your table. Uh, it was a struggle because, like, uh, I had, I had no work for two months. I had no work for two months. So, but uh, Derek, uh, my son Derek was still a, he was still small then. So, um, no, no, no. Derek was still there yet. What? Uh, yeah, I think he was still not, uh, not yet, not yet, not yet there. So, but that had an effect on us uh, uh, raising up Derek because. Um, it was challenging financially. And when I did go back to the full-time ministry, it was only me. My wife wasn't full-time when I, uh, when I, when I, when I started leading the church once again in Cavite. Mm-hmm. So all of those thoughts coming into my mind, I was really struggling with it. Yeah. But um, the thing that I've learned is that um, life may be tough. Life may be hard. But we have to own up. We have to own up to the things that we did and be better. But as well, allow God to allow God to 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 help you go through that process. Because I look I I look I look back now, look, looking at where I am at now, and looking back. Uh, a couple of uh, that was like 2009. Looking back, then, from my vantage point now, I would say I would not be the kind of person that I am now if that this that situation didn't happen. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that God wanted me to sin, right. but I think God allowed it for a reason. Right. And that reason I have seen from God's perspective has made me into uh, the man that I am now. More understanding of people, especially grace, because um, I know now what it feels to fall Mm. and be given that opportunity to be given grace. So now I've learned to be more understanding and gracious of people. I've learned to be more encouraging more giving to people Mm -hmm. because I have also been given to get to a point at where I am at right now. Right. That's, but I think the most important lesson is, um, just having that grit, uh, uh, that grit to bounce back up. Now, even if it's hard, um, you just get back up. Right. And, Sometimes a lot of things will not make sense. But now, du- during that time, a lot of things didn't make sense to me during that time when I was in sin. Right. And then when I was repenting, bro, to be honest, there was a time that I was I was having my bike ride and I was really struggling in my mind that I was like traveling 40 kilometers an hour in my bike that I wanted to... I wanted to crash myself i wanted to i wanted to crash myself in, in another vehicle because i because of because of that emotional struggle that i was having in my mind i, I just wanted to end it mm-hmm. i just wanted to end it right I, I i had those thoughts and i had to and i had to wrestle through it it wasn't hard it wasn't easy and and, and a lot of things didn't make sense but looking back now now it makes sense a deeper conviction towards sin of how it affects people, of how it affects you, 
affects the people around you. That's why the condition of not to avoid, to avoid sinning, to avoid uh, doing what is not right in God's eyes. I, I have a deeper conviction about that right now. The power of confession. The things that you wouldn't learn and have a deep conviction with if you didn't go through it. Right. So, well, th well, that word grit, you brought that up a couple times and it definitely fits with your life. And running in a race 16 hours long, you had the grit to finish it, to go through a challenging time where you, you struggled with sin and then you overcame it. That's you're, you're a gritty person. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that definitely stands out ab about you. What inspires me is that you've, you could have easily gone to the States. You could have said, Hey, I've sacrificed a lot. I've, I've paid the price. I could be back with my family in the States living a, a, a different life, a uh, more comfortable life. And yet you still, decided to stick it out. That's, that's inspiring. Any final words that you would give a person who's thinking, you know, I'd really like to live a life of significance. I want to make, I want to make this life count. Any, yeah. any advice you would give to a person that, that was thinking, Hey, I, I want to grow. I want to make a difference for God. Yeah. Um, I became a Christian 20, when I was, I think 23, 24. And my background was, I was hooked on vices. When I became a Christian, um, everything changed. Um, I started to see the kind of life that God wanted for me. And if I was to say uh, or give a parting word to anybody out there, a Christian, a young, a young Christian, or maybe even a mature Christian, was going through some challenge in his life. All I can say is this, um, that our life as Christians okay, will always be full of challenges, but those challenges are what make us. The challenges that we make is what makes us who we are right now. We are a product of that. And that's why when you go through a challenge, you need to have a you need to have a faithful and positive attitude towards it. That even if life is hard, uh, there's always something better that will come out of it. Mm. We cannot control. There are things that we cannot control, but there are things that we can control. The things that we can control, that's what we do. Right. That's what we that's what we hold on to. Right. And um, that's why um, I cannot control. Um, economics, but I can control how I respond to economics by adjusting mm -hmm, right. <laughs> our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I can control. I can control. I can control that. So I can control what people think of me, but I can control how I respond to it. Mm -hmm. So focus on what you can control and allow God to do the rest with your life. I think with that's God. Yeah. I, I think that's such a, an important idea for this time because events are out of our control. There's so many things that we cannot control. And, and for a person like yourself who's, who's action-oriented, aggressive, a competitor, uh, a former basketball player and an at tri triathlon, it must be challenging you know, to, to feel like, okay, you know, I can't totally control this, but I think it's wise that what you're, what you're saying there of, Hey, what can you control? Try, try to control the areas that you can control. And I, I'm encouraged. I, I'm inspired by the time talking to you. Thank you so much, Bong, for, for our time together today. Yes. Thank you too, Rob. I look, uh, I look forward to as well. Maybe I can invite you to preach to our church in the Philippines. That'd be great. Uh, one time. I look forward to it sometime. That'd be great. And I want to thank you today for listening to the Rob Skinner podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, I'd like to ask you to let your friends know, let your family know. You can also email me with feedback or questions. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at rob at tucsonchurchofchrist.org. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count, to live a no regrets life, and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I want to encourage you to have a great day and make this life count.